This podcast is brought to you by the listeners of the Irish History Podcast who have become patrons at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. If you become a patron today, you not only support the show, but you also get access to lots of great content. First of all, as a patron, you will get access to the show before everyone else. Patrons also get an episode guide that contains lots of more sources and further reading. The episode guide for this show has links to documents and books produced in the 1840s that are available online. Patrons also get a monthly patrons podcast, an exclusive show made only for you, the patrons. The next patrons show is going to look at Charles Trevelyan's life. Many of you might have heard of his name before. He's an extremely controversial but very influential British civil servant during the famine. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and get that show about his life. So that address one last time is patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Each week I'm taking time to thank the listeners who have become patrons without whom this series on the Great Famine would not happen. This week I want to thank Paul Reynolds, Mark Malone, Deborah Bohan, JJ Kirby, Brenner, Evan Wyland, Derv Lacar, E.C. Marcon, Alexander, Mike Ryan and Susan Lucas. Thanks a million folks, I really appreciate your support. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is the 1846 Summer of Starvation. The Great Famine, Part 7 With starvation building since the failure of the potato crop in September 1845, it was increasingly obvious that the summer of 1846 was going to be a key period. Through the early months of 1846, an out-and-out famine situation was just about contained. Many, however, were holding out for a key date. That was May the 15th, when the British government of Robert Peel planned a major intervention having imported nearly 20 million kilos of Indian maize to feed the starving poor. This podcast looks at whether this intervention worked, because if it didn't, the stakes could not be higher, with several million people facing starvation. One of the aims of these shows has been to give you a sense of what life was like at the time and how it developed during the Great Famine. So to this end, I like giving you specific stories rather than just general history. So in this show, I did a bit of digging and I found a forgotten story that I think illustrates what life was like in that increasingly tense summer of 1846. So the last show began with a forgotten story of poaching, but this episode kicks off with a similarly unknown chapter from the famine years. This, however, is a far more serious and deadly crime. And if there are younger listeners, it might be worth having an adult listen first to see if they think it's appropriate. Finally, before we begin, I want to explain why this show is a week late. This episode proved really hard to get right and a lot of the research was very time consuming, particularly the individual stories at the beginning and the end. Thanks to everyone, especially the patrons, for your patience. I think sometimes it is better to wait than rush something out. Anyway, I hope you all enjoy the show. Theresa Cornwallis, a wealthy English heiress, visited Ireland on a holiday in the summer of 1846. By the time she landed, the island had seen the food crisis, which had been triggered by the loss of the potato crop in 1845, deteriorate week by week, leaving thousands facing a desperate situation. However, Cornwallis, a woman who stayed in the houses of the rich and powerful, encountered little of this starvation. Sure enough, she frequently talked about poverty when she later published a book based on her experiences in Ireland in 1846, but the reader gets little sense of a looming crisis. The account that emerges through the pages of her book differs little from that of other accounts of Ireland in the early 19th century. Now, this is not because Theresa Cornwallis was indifferent to the suffering of Irish people, In fact, she saw herself as sympathetic to Ireland's general poverty and encouraged her readers to spend a portion of the wealth bestowed upon them by Providence in Ireland, where she said they would be received with the Cade Mila Falcha, so grateful to the ear of the wayfarer. The mention of Cade Mila Falcha, or 100,000 welcomes, 
certainly isn't the impression of what we might expect in famine-era Ireland. However, the reality was that even still, by that summer of 1846, while the situation was deteriorating fast and many were nearing starvation with each passing day, none of what would become the terrible hallmarks of the Great Famine, dead bodies strewn along the roadside, massively overcrowded workhouses or huge crowds gathering in ports to emigrate had yet materialised. Now that said, these are pretty extreme definitions of famine and certainly by that summer of 1846 when Theresa Cornwallis arrived, some of the less well-known and less obvious indicators of mass starvation such as spiralling crime, lawlessness and social upheaval were present and did indicate that something terrible was afoot in Ireland. Now for a visitor like Theresa Cornwallis who had never been to Ireland before and spent her time in the houses of the wealthy, she would never have spotted these, but they were there for the trained eye. Only a few weeks before Theresa arrived, a shocking crime had taken place in Woodford, County Galway, that was indicative of the wider anxiety, fears and tension resulting from the famine that were pushing crime rates in Ireland through the roof. Woodford is situated in the extreme east of County Galway, pinned between the Schlievaughty Mountains, a ridge of low-lying hills, and the River Shannon. The land around Woodford does not in any way look like the postcard image of the harsh landscape of the west of Ireland. Watered by the River Shannon, the land here is green and lush in summer. However, on the night of the 25th to the 26th of June, 1846, this small rural parish witnessed a brutal killing, one that even stood out in an era when newspapers eagerly reported grisly crimes from across the globe. Two men approached the house of a small farmer, Patrick Hill, who lived with his 25-year-old wife and their infant child. Arriving late at night, around one o'clock in the morning, the two men demanded entry to the house and food. This was hardly surprising, given the situation in the surrounding landscape. A few months previously, in March 1846, the parish of Woodford had asked the government to send Indian maize to feed the increasingly hungry population. Given the Hill family were said to be in comfortable circumstances, the arrival of would-be thieves can hardly have surprised them. However, while the Hills were preparing food, the door to their house was broken in and they were faced by two short men, one of whom wore a straw hat. They told Patrick Hill that they wanted to speak to him outside and when he asked could he change his clothes, they insisted it wouldn't take long. They took Patrick Hill about 40 yards from his house where they brutally attacked him with a bayonet. When his wife heard his desperate screams she ran out and arriving on the scene she found her husband bloodied in agony. One of the men then pushed her to the ground but before he could attack her the other intervened telling him to stop and leave the 25-year-old Mrs Hill to look after her soon-to-be fatherless child. The ferocious attack on Patrick Hill continued and he expired there in a quiet lane near his house. While initially newspapers reported that he'd been stabbed 14 times, the coroner at his inquest a few days later counted 42 bayonet wounds on his body. As far as I could ascertain from research, no one was ever charged with this brutal murder. Indeed, it remained a mystery to those outside this tight-knit community. Whatever exactly provoked such a terrible killing will probably remain unknown forever. Indeed, this is possibly the first time anyone has recalled Patrick Hill's death in 150 years. Now, you might be wondering why I bothered to bring up this story at all, but there is context to Patrick Hill's death. Hill was not the only person to die a violent death in Ireland in the summer of 1846. Far from it. While we think of famine as a story of people starving to death, it's far more complex. Events like Patrick Hill's violent death are very much part of the story. As food ran out, tensions in all levels of Irish society were ratcheting up and violence of all kinds was breaking out. In this context, there was every chance Patrick Hill's death was in some way connected to these tensions. Indeed, statistics don't lie. And while Theresa Cornwallis, the English heiress, may have been oblivious to it in the few short weeks she spent in Ireland, Ireland was undoubtedly becoming an increasingly violent society as a result of the growing hunger in 1846. Serious crime was soaring as the desperation and tension 
in society broke through the surface. Murders were up 28% in 1846. Aggravated assault was up 11%. Assault endangering life was up nearly 20%. House burgling had increased nearly threefold and unsurprisingly cattle stealing had gone through the roof increasing by nearly 400%. In this context it's entirely possible Patrick Hill's murder was just one of the forgotten aspects of the Great Famine that was already in evidence in the summer of 1846. When we see what was happening in wider society during that summer it will become obvious why such violent crimes were increasing. In part 6 of this series we saw the crisis in Ireland develop through 1846 and had even broken out into serious riots by March and April. As these tensions grew, many had identified May the 15th of 1846 as the decisive moment when they hoped these tensions provoking these riots and indeed Patrick Hill's death would abate somewhat. It was on that date that the British government planned their major intervention to stave off famine. The Prime Minister, Robert Peel, had imported £100,000 of Indian maize and they had identified the key time as June, July and August when existing food stocks would run out. At that point they intended to release this Indian maize onto the market. By late August and early September they hoped the harvest of 1846 would be brought in and the crisis overall would come to an end. Now the maize, they hoped, would ensure that the poor could afford to eat something at least when they were priced out of the food market as potatoes were beginning to soar in cost. However, even though the stocks of maize were large, some 20 million kilos, there was still very good reason to be anxious about what lay ahead even after May the 15th. Ireland was by no means out of the woods when it reached this date. While the stocks of Indian maize appeared vast, they were still probably going to run far short of what was needed. It amounted to what would feed one million people for just over one month. With way more than one million people needing food for three months, the food was clearly going to run out and something had to give. Secondly, even regardless of the quantities, the Indian maize itself was not ideal. It is what is known in Ireland today as sweet corn. What we receive is heavily processed, but what was shipped to Ireland in the 1840s was absolutely rock hard completely inedible and needed to be processed. So when it was brought ashore in Cork throughout 1846, it was first dried in kilns, then cooled for 48 hours before being ground and then cooled again. When this had been carried out in Cork, the maize was distributed around the country, but even still it needed to be boiled for a long time before it could be eaten. However, Irish people in the 1840s were not well acquainted with this maize and how to cook it and many suffered severe stomach cramps and illnesses from eating poorly prepared maize. Unsurprisingly, even though newspapers at the time started to print recipes, many people, initially at least, were very sceptical of this yellow food, even after the food depots opened on May the 15th. Nevertheless, as starvation deepened, and many parts of the country faced famine. The food depots were quickly overwhelmed, some even opening 15 hours a day. As we saw in the last episode, the government had no intention though of giving the food in these depots out for free. Instead, it was being sold at cost price so that the wider food market would not be undermined. However, even despite this, many could still not afford the maize even though it was being sold at cost price and it was clear that 1846 was going to be a long and dangerously hungry summer for many in Ireland and it was no surprise that tensions continued to brew in wider society. Indeed, through that summer of 1846, crowds of paupers could be seen parading behind individuals carrying loaves of bread mounted on a long pole to symbolise the fact that there was food available but it was out of their reach because they could no longer afford it. These tensions were only exacerbated by those in charge of the relief programmes, the officials in the Treasury in London who on June the 3rd, after three weeks of huge demand on the May supplies in the relief depots, changed the price of this food that so many now depended on. It was no longer going to be sold at cost price, but instead, from early June, 
it was going to be sold at the market price of maize. The logic behind this move was strange to say the least. The officials in the Treasury in London claimed that the high demand indicated that the poor obviously then had the resources to buy the corn, so therefore there was no reason to interfere with the market in any way, shape or form. They didn't seem to countenance the idea that the starving poor in Ireland were just absolutely desperate. By the end of June, halfway through what was the projected period that this food was due to last, the Indian maize that had been imported was already running out. There was no option but to buy more, but this really rankled against the ideas of the free market ideologues in the Treasury in London. They had never agreed with the overall plan in the first place, and Charles Trevelyan, the chief undersecretary, that's a top civil servant, was adamant that while they would buy more, this would be the final purchasing. They would not continually buy food for the starving poor in Ireland. Whatever Trevelyan's opinions, or indeed the opinions of some in Ireland since the famine, despite all its flaws, there is no denying that the decision taken by Robert Peel in 1845 to import corn did work. Even when the price was raised to market levels, Indian maize was within reach for most of the poor. However, that said, it had only just worked, and for many it certainly had been touch and go at times. For example, a lot of people had lived dangerously close to malnourishment and had to feed themselves by utterly impoverishing themselves, selling anything they could to pawn shops to get money to buy food. An account from just outside my hometown of Castlecomer in County Kilkenny reported that the poor were living on weeds during that summer. However, overall, the depths and horrors of what would become features of the Great Famine were being staved off during that summer of 1846. While mass deaths were avoided, next we need to travel across the sea to London because a new political crisis there in the summer of 1846 did not bode well for Ireland. But next I'm going to take a quick break. In the last podcast, we saw how Robert Peel, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, which had of course encompassed Ireland since 1801, had been embroiled in controversy through the winter of 1845. When he attempted to repeal the Corn Laws, a tax on the import of grains, he had been faced with a major revolt from the ranks of his own party. While he had been forced from office in December 1845, Peel had managed to return two weeks later when the opposition failed to form a government. In the new year of 1846, Peel then pushed ahead with his plans to get rid of the Corn Laws, putting a bill to this effect on the floor of the House of Commons on January the 26th. However, his own party still remained divided on the issue, and even though he was party leader, Peel could only command the loyalty of about one third of his MPs, while his rival in the Conservative Party, George Benthink, who wanted to keep the Corn Laws, was able to muster two thirds. Peel therefore found himself in a difficult and pretty strange position. He could press ahead now, but he was utterly dependent on the rival Liberal Party, headed by a man whom he disliked, Lord John Russell. The Liberals, for their part, desperately wanted to get rid of the Corn Laws and were willing to support Peel as long as he could deliver this. Therefore, through the early months of 1846, the Prime Minister only held office in opposition to his own party, but with the support of what was supposedly the official opposition. While Robert Peel did successfully pass a bill removing the Corn Laws, he was a dead man walking, politically speaking, after this. Two-thirds of his own party despised him as a traitor to their principles, while the Liberals, who had always disliked him, were only willing to back him until he repealed the Corn Laws. Literally the day after the King signed the repeal of the Corn Laws into effect in June 1846, all of Peel's enemies turned on him. The following day he brought forward what should have been a bill to unify the Conservative Party, which was an Irish coercion bill. Now, Irish coercion bills were effectively a suspension of normal legal protections for citizens, and in 1846, the rising levels of unrest in Ireland were used as a pretext to bring in this coercion bill. If there was one thing that the Conservatives could all agree on, it was laws like this. Indeed, never before had a Conservative voted against one of these coercive acts of legislation brought forward about Ireland. 
When the debate started, Peel supporters pursued the usual course of action. They fear-mongered about murders and violence in Ireland. Even the case of Patrick Hill, who had been murdered only a few days previously, was mentioned in the House of Commons. However, when it was put to a vote on June the 26th, 1846, Peel faced a truly remarkable situation. Lord Bentinck, his rival in the Conservative Party, walked into the House of Commons, leading 200 MPs from Peel's own party to vote against the Coercion Bill, or in reality, vote against Robert Peel. Joined by Lord John Russell's Liberals and the Irish MPs in the House of Commons, Robert Peel had no chance. By the day's end, he had lost the vote. His government had fallen and his career was at an end. Now this had far-reaching consequences in Ireland, given what came next. In the following weeks, Lord John Russell, the leader of the Liberal Party, now took power and he would remain the Prime Minister for the rest of the famine. He, and more importantly, his ideology, would have a huge impact in Ireland. While Robert Peel may have been a late convert to free market thinking, and he had been willing to bend his views when it came to the famine by importing Indian maize, Lord John Russell and his Liberal Party were totally committed to the ideas of free trade. It was their unifying principle. They firmly believed that the government should intervene as little as possible, even in famine situations. They were convinced that if the market was allowed to take hold without any government interference, it would resolve the issue. They, for example, would not import Indian maize like Robert Peel had done, the very thing that had staved off famine in early 1846. And there was definitely no hope that they would bring in a ban on exports or close ports in Ireland. Now, before we move forward with the story, it is worth taking a moment now to look at the changes in personnel that took place after the fall of Robert Peel's government, because this sees a few individuals leave our story. Lord Hewtsbury, the Lord Lieutenant or representative of the British government in Ireland, who we met at the start of the series, was among the first to go. Having been appointed by Robert Peel in 1844, he was replaced by the Liberals when they took power. His successor was Lord Bessborough, an Irish landlord. The second most powerful office in the United Kingdom, that of Chancellor of the Exchequer, was taken over by Charles Wood, a committed free marketeer. Obviously, the most important change was that Robert Peel himself fell from power, and it is worth taking a moment to take stock of what he did during his time in charge during the Great Famine. Generally speaking, it is agreed that the measures taken by Peel were effective, the Freeman's Journal famously reflected several months after his departure that no man died of famine during his administration and it is a boast of which he might be well proud of. This, however, was written during the darkest chapters of the famine in 1847. But there still is something to this. While there had been deaths by this stage which could be attributed to famine, they were few and far between under Peel's reign. Peel's measures did see Ireland true to the harvest of 1846, which it was hoped by many would end the crisis. However, the historian Christine Keneally does point out a few other factors that need to be borne in mind before we close the book on Robert Peel. He had made contingencies based on the predictions of the scientific commission he had sent to Ireland in 1845, which had predicted a total collapse of the potato crop. This had not happened and as we've seen around 30% of the crop had been lost. However, had the original predictions materialised, Robert Peel's measures would have been hopelessly inadequate. Critics of Peel also hone in on his other actions, specifically around the Corn Laws during the winter of 1845. As we saw in the last episode, his linking of the Corn Laws to the famine had long-term consequences in Ireland and allowed those who wanted to in England deny the very existence of starvation in Ireland. What Peel would have done had he stayed in office is little more than counterfactual history, but it is fair to say that overall he was better than what followed him, because Lord John Russell and his Liberal Party, armed with what were pretty extreme views of society and the economy, were not the people you wanted in charge, particularly given what was unfolding back in Ireland in the high summer of 1846.
Theresa Cornwallis, the wealthy heiress we met at the beginning of the episode, had arrived in Ireland on July the 10th, 1846, and as chance would have it, the same evening, Lord Bessborough, the new Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, arrived to replace Lord Hewtesbury. Well, Bessborough set off for Dublin, and the pomp and ceremony that welcomed all new Lords Lieutenant, Theresa Cornwallis was off on a holiday tour of Ireland. In the coming weeks she travelled extensively, visiting sites of natural beauty and historic interest across the island. She kept a journal of her travels, which, as we saw earlier, were published in a book entitled A Summer Visit to Ireland. Now, through the pages of that book, a very faint thread emerges where Cornwallis unknowingly recorded the very early stages of what was nothing short of an utter calamity taking hold in Ireland in the summer of 1846. Cornwallis first headed south towards the town of Bray in County Wicklow. For some strange peculiarity, the blight had a minimal effect in the mountainous terrain of the county in 1845. She stayed a night in Shangana Castle, the home of George Cockburn, a renowned general, and began to make her way inland into the heart of the Wicklow Mountains. Disturbingly on her trip, Cornwallis casually recorded on July the 12th that in Wicklow, where the crop had been sound in 1845, potatoes were beginning to fail. She did not dwell on the topic as her writing and thoughts were consumed by a visit to the medieval monastery of Glendalough the following day. However, the thread of diseased potatoes continued throughout her account. By July the 18th, she had reached Kilkenny, where she said, Beggars were in numbers here, and potatoes failing generally. When she reached South Tipperary, she proclaimed, The potatoes here were all gone to the bad entirely. Then, on her arrival in Castle Island in County Kerry, not far from the Atlantic Ocean, she elaborated, The potatoes were on the go, sometimes one patch, would be blackened, the rest healthy, and all those affecting holding down their heads as if frostbitten. Over the 300-odd pages of her book, these mentions of the potato crop were few and far between, ultimately taking up what probably amounted to a few paragraphs. While Cornwallis may not have realised it, from what she was seeing, it was obvious that the potato blight which had caused so much trouble in Ireland the previous year was returning, but also it was breaking out two months earlier than it had in 1845. These extra two months would give it a chance to spread right across the island. It could potentially destroy the entire crop now. This was truly terrifying. Millions across Ireland had just survived through 1846, but they had all been focusing on getting the new harvest in, in August and September. But now, in July, the blight was reappearing and endangering that harvest. By July the 20th, the government were increasingly aware. Charles Trevelyan in the Treasury in London received a report telling him the disease is reappearing, the reports of the new crop are very unfavourable. This was an understatement. The blight of 1845 was going to be minor compared to what was about to take place in 1846. To make matters worse, the new government of Lord John Russell were the last people you would want in charge in this situation. In the next episode, we are going to see what happens through the later months of 1846. Until next time, Sloan.